responding to comments, especially from vegans and people who are pro mainstream on the recent uh, review I did of Dr. Christopher Gardner and Andrew Huberman's um, yeah, podcast. Uh, this is mostly going to be responses to the pod part two of that video. I, let me know if you want me to make a part three. There's still a lot of that video I haven't seen. Um, but thanks for your comments. Come, keep them coming through. I mean, I think there's a couple of, it's useful for me because I think we're, we're retreading ground that has been tread on this channel multiple times, but it's just a useful reminder to me that I actually have to keep saying the same thing like, because there's new people and they haven't heard the responses and they still, they, some of the vegans especially think they're being clever, regurgitating talking points that I learned as a vegan in 1994, right? So yeah, let's just, let's, let's look at this and get it out of the way. Can you be addicted to food? That's a big question. Can you be addicted to food that is ancestrally appropriate that we know humans have been eating since the first humans existed? I would say no. This guy says yes. I don't frankly care. Or, or, or this is guys having a long conversation with me. Listen, if you're going to cite epidemiological data showing that people do well on rice, keep in mind that a lot of that epidemiological data is like it really has no basis in fact. Because when you actually look at other epidemiological data, you see that the more meat a population eats, the better off they do. That's especially the case in, in Asia, right? Especially the case in so-called rice eating countries, especially the case in a, in a place like Hong Kong and so on, right? So, and here there's a disparity of data, like some data is worth more than other data. So if you have data telling me that vegetarian diets are good, that's fine, but that doesn't prove the hypothesis. If I have diets showing that vegetarian diets are bad, that they don't correlate with better outcomes, that's way, way, way more powerful. It doesn't prove anything about meat eating, but it disproves your hypothesis, right? This is the scientific method 101 stuff. And, you know, formulate a hypothesis, seek to disprove it. Be a good scientist, right? If you're interested in, in science, if you're interested in healing, it's a completely different process. It's more about trial and error, maybe. And I would argue that you start with the ancestrally pro appropriate human diet, which is a hyper carnivorous diet of at least 70% meat and other animal foods. Someone quoted AI at me. Please don't do that. Like AI is just a waste of time, friends. Um, yeah, please don't do that. Um, it's not about what humans ate. It's about what the evidence shows leads to the best long-term outcomes, right? Two completely different outcomes, uh, arguments. Now, let me, let me put it to you this way. Let me give a very um, clear example. And I think this is what I do. If I take an elephant from the wild and I put, uh, let's say I have two elephants or two families of elephants. One I put on a diet of cake and beer. One I put on a diet of rice and squash, for example, yeah? Neither of those are ancestrally appropriate diets for elephants, based on what I understand about elephant diets, which is very little. But I will assume that the diet of rice and squash does better than the diet of cake and beer, right? That's my assumption. Does that mean that the best diet for an elephant is the, cake and, is the rice and squash? No, the best diet for an elephant is whatever that elephant was eating in the wild, right? So, my point, that point is about the limitations of the current state of evidence. You haven't actually tested ancestral human diets to the extent that they should be tested, right? So you don't know that, right? You're just saying, um, you're saying that that correlates with the best long-term health outcomes. And, and to the extent that you've, you've tested, for example, high meat diets, as I point out in this video, the high meat diet does better than every other kind of diet by every marker except LDL, right? So anyway, that's something to think about. Um, uh, Garuda Legends is a legend. Thanks for commenting. Your comments are always uh, insightful. Um, Plant-based diets inhibit prostate cancer. So this is the kind of statement that we absolutely cannot make. And I'm very careful never to make this kind of statement in um, when we, in other words, it's not a, maybe someone got a good result on a plant-based diet with prostate cancer. Absolutely. But other people don't, right? And when we look at the role of diet in treating cancers, prostate cancer, you see that there are several diets that have been tried and all of them have reversed some degree of cancer, right? And in my view, looking at the literature, ketogenic diets, which are the closest to an ancestrally appropriate diet, I would argue, although not exactly, um, they're the ones that have the m best success in treating cancer in general and prostate cancer in, in particular. So that's not to say that it's going to work 100% of the times. So we need to be very, very careful about how we word these things. And in other words, what I'm saying is the the data as it currently exists indicates that dietary interventions for cancer and prostate cancer could have some benefit. And of those for some people in some cases, and of those diets, it looks to me as though ketogenic diets are the most promising. Does that mean that ketogenic diets cure cancer? Of course not, right? We need to be very, very careful here. 
um, this guy is so funny. He's saying, you know, you can sue me. Um, cool, fine, whatever. I mean, that, that's why I, I'm very careful about what I say um, and why I say, you know, don't get on or off medication without consulting your doctor, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because um, you can't actually sue me because I'm careful. Um, it would be interesting to do a psyche and actress, uh, analysis on Dr. Gardner. Um, yeah, Dr. Gardner has been very clear about why he's saying what he's saying. If you look at other interviews, and I, I think I mentioned this in the long blog, blog post that I refer to, um, or maybe I'll leave a, a comment. I'll leave the, the link in the comments down below. Um, he's very clear that he's doing this because he thinks it's it's an environmentally friendly position, and he wants to support young people who are attacking meat to support the environment, or at least that's how they see it, right? And and so, given that he has that bias, given that that's how he's understanding things, we have to be very careful about how he's constructing these studies, especially post A to Z, where he found out that the Atkins diet was the best by every metric, right? Um, Someone is carnivore, good for you. Um, let us know how it goes. Um, yeah, I'm not a big Mendelian randomization person. I think it's just correlation, and this person appreciates my views on that. Um, this is such a funny comment. Did we evolve to wear glasses? And then I, I laugh, and it's like, dude, if you want to be taken seriously, say something that's actually worth taking seriously. Are we living in the environment that existed 200,000 years ago? No, of course not. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that any animal, the default diet for any animal is the diet that it evolved to eat. I don't think that's a controversial position. This is just like common sense. Famous vegetarians, who the hell cares? Um, this person forgot to name Hitler. <laughs> like, um, No matter how much, um, yeah, we're not a cow, fair enough. Um, someone's complaining that I'm calling people names. Look, I try and be as restrained as I possibly can, but I've been in this a long time. And if I express my frustration in a certain way, you're just gonna have to live with it, man. Um, genetics, individualization. So in my view, all those things are super overstated. However, I will say health looks the same for everyone, but sickness looks different. Like if there's a million sick people, there's a million different forms of sickness. So we do need some individualization. But again, when we're talking about the diet, the diet isn't everything, but the diet is often a good first step. And when we're talking about that, an ancestrally appropriate diet is a good jumping off point. It may need further tweaks, right? Um, average lifespan fallacy. So, so again, we have evidence of longevity going back thousands of years. And it's we don't actually need that evidence because we have the genes, right? We know that some people will live to age 80, 90, 100 right now, right? So that means that we coded for those genes for some particular purpose. They, didn't, they, they don't show up randomly, right? And at the moment, anthropologists are talking about the grandmother hypothesis the idea that child raising is such an intent, labor intensive process among humans that it required more than one sort of mother, if you like, and the grandmother plays that role. That's a theory, that's a hypothesis, but it seems to be a, a good hypothesis. It seems to be something that's there. Uh, the science doesn't back me up. Um, yeah, whatever, dude. So, so I'm looking specifically in nitrogen isotope analysis of the long bones of Paleolithic humans which show that humans were higher up the trophic level than lions and remained that way right up until the Neolithic period. It's not in serious doubt. And I will say this again. In fact, I'm going to write a longer blog, blog post referring to some of the recent articles about this. Even the articles that are looking at the introduction of grains and vegetables and so on refer to humans as mostly meat eating or high meat eaters or sometimes hyper carnivores. I wish they would use that term. That term is more a zoological term than an anthropological term. But that's what they mean. There's a paper, maybe I'll put it on the screen right now, where we see that this guy's looking at the difference between, based on tooth enamel and tooth decay, trying to understand the different plant foods one population was eating from another. And what they find is that if you read the introduction, if you read the abstract, they're still referring to humans as high meat eaters, right? This is someone who's arguing that plant food played a big role in these populations and still is saying that the majority was meat, okay? So it's not, it's not in, in doubt here. Yeah, Plant-based has a science on site. Yeah, I don't, I don't actually care. Yeah, more about the, the inverse of data. So if I cite correlational data, which shows, and we have that study, which shows that meat eating correlates with longevity in 175 countries, that is correlational data. It doesn't prove anything, but it goes a long way towards disproving the idea that eating vegetables is healthy, right? Or promotes longevity. Because we don't just don't see that in, in the real world. We see that people who eat more meat have longer longevity at a population level, right? So again, it's, it's one of those things. I can see a million birds that fly. It doesn't prove the hypothesis all birds fly. I can see a million populations where vegetable eating is healthy. It doesn't prove the hypothesis vegetable eating is healthy. You need to look for the one outlier. Eat whole foods. Yeah, I mean, 
the thing with the eat whole foods thing is when you look at the the birth of diabetes, you look at the birth of heart disease and so on, you find that they were thousands of years ago, right? The first uh, case of documented diabetes was 2000 years ago with um, Sushrutha in India. We talk about this in the interview with Dr. Manushi Bhattacharya. You, can, you should really check that out if you haven't yet. Super important interview on this channel. Um, and so, and then the first incidents, we have mummies that were sort of, we can prove died from a heart attack, those mummies, right? By looking at their arteries and so on. That was in ancient Egypt, you know, maybe a, more than 2000 years ago, right? And ancient Egypt was a wheat eating place. They were called the wheat eaters by the Romans, right? So again, this doesn't prove anything, but it's showing that the problem is not just modernity. Yes, that's a problem, but it's not the only problem. Um, plant sentience is not something I want to talk about right now. Nuts are healthy for who, man? My my daughter takes a nut and she will literally like have to be run to the hospital and get injections, right? Because she's allergic. So calling something healthy or unhealthy, like these are value judgments. <laughs> what we are concerned with on this channel largely is the species appropriate diet for humans, which is a hyper carnivorous diet made largely but not exclusively of high fat animal foods because the animals that humans evolved to hunt and evolved to eat were these megafauna with huge fat deposits right once you understand that as the starting point uh, then we can begin to have a proper discussion until we understand that as the starting point we're just treading water here we're just spinning our wheels and, and saying the same thing over and over in different ways so anyway i hope that helps um, let me know what you think thanks and i'll see you in the next one